Now, we'll look at the final levels of protein structure, tertiary and quaternary structure. Why are we doing tertiary and quaternary structures together? As we'll see, they're actually quite similar. They both describe the arrangement of a protein at a higher level than, of course, the simple secondary and primary structures. In both cases, the specific three-dimensional shape of the protein results from assembling parts through largely non-covalent interactions, the van der Waals bonds, salt bridges, and hydrogen bonds. And that's why tertiary and quaternary structures are often described together. All right, so as I explained earlier, the tertiary structures of proteins are built upon multiple different secondary structures coming together, hydrogen bonding together, creating the salt bridges from the loops, also what they call van der Waals bonds. And once they come together, they create tertiary structures. And tertiary structures basically are independent mineral structures that can function on its own. So as you can see, once we combine multiple tertiary structures together, these independent structures that can function independently, they now come together to create overall functioning protein, which are quaternary structures, which we'll get into quaternary here soon. All right, so let's keep this moving quickly, family. Now, more specifically, the tertiary structures are the arrangement of helices, beta sheets, and loops within a single polypeptide. They are three-dimensional arrangements. Whereas quaternary structures is the rearrangement of several polypeptides into a protein complex that performs a specific cellular function. All right, like I just explained with the hemoglobin, but I'm glad that I explained that because once I thoroughly explain to you what hemoglobin is doing within the, its quaternary structure, how it's built, we'll truly understand what it truly means by cellular function because hemoglobin performs a function. That's what a protein is. It performs a function. All right. So I had to take you through the entire process of how a protein is built, how a mineral structure is built, what they call amino acids, the mineral structures are built, so you can truly understand what's being said here. Man, they're going to have to put these trainings inside the school so kids can truly understand the body from a higher level, because when it's explained like this, we can really understand it, all right? So now let's truly talk about and dive into tertiary structures. The tertiary structure is built from motifs. Motifs are simply multiple secondary structures. All right. So the tertiary structure is built from motifs to domains. And once multiple motifs come together, multiple secondary structures come together, they create a domain, which is called a tertiary structure. And then the tertiary structure goes on to create the protein, the domain, the tertiary structure, because I got to keep telling you all these names and all these words because they give you di multiple different words to explain the same thing. So when they're talking about motifs, they're talking about secondary structures. When they're talking about domains, they're talking about tertiary structures. And when they're talking about the actual protein itself, they're talking about the quaternary structure. All right. So when we described how the secondary structure elements are arranged spatially, it's useful to define the hierarchy of the structure. So we have to understand how proteins are built to truly understand proteins, all right? So here is a full structure of alcohol dehydrogenase as a cartoon with the helices in green, the sheets in blue, and the loops in gray, all right? So now we understand that to build tertiary structures, we have to use multiple secondary structures or multiple motifs. Motifs are basically secondary structures, all right? And the motifs go into creating domains, which is what this is. This is a domain of multiple different motifs, multiple different secondary structures that have now come together, that have hydrogen bonded together, created the salt bridges together, hydrogen bonded together to create this domain of motifs, to create the domain of motifs. And these domains go on to build multiple domains and hydrogen bond multiple domains together which go into creating actual proteins, all right? So let's keep it moving, baby. So the smallest grouping of secondary structure is a motif, which I just explained. And that is made up of several secondary structure elements that assemble in a consistent way, all right? So to build tertiary structures, these secondary structures have to be assembled in a consistent way. This is what goes on to create the tertiary structures or the domains, all right? 
So like their name suggests, motifs recur in many different proteins, as we already know, because this is just the second level of protein building with varying sequences. So a very common motif, which we've isolated here, is a beta alpha beta motif. And that simply just means we got a beta sheet. This loop connects it to an alpha helices. And then this alpha helices is connected by another loop to another beta strand. And once these beta strands come together parallelly, this is what creates a beta sheet. All right. So I want everybody to understand this. So this is where we have the beta alpha beta motif. All right, this is a motif. These are secondary structures coming together to build a motif that can function once we put it into tertiary form, all right? So they have to become motifs before they can become domains, before we can you know, build multiple motifs on top of each other. We gotta actually create a motif. You gotta actually create a secondary structure, all right? So where two adjacent beta strands are connected by an alpha helices, this is one of the most common, a very common motif, a beta alpha beta motif, okay? Notice how this allows the formation of a parallel beta sheet, as I just explained. It forms a parallel beta sheet once you have this type of motif, all right? One or more motifs can assemble to form a compact globular structure, which is called a domain or a tertiary structure. So everything that I've been saying, this is just showing it to you vividly so you can truly let it sink in all right let's keep it moving so here the c terminal beta alpha beta motif this yellow highlighted motif interacts with additional beta strands and several other helices to form a domain domains are independent folding units within proteins an independent structure all right that i just i explained earlier so this independent folding structure within the protein is what is known as a domain or a tertiary structure. An isolated domain can usually fold on its own and maintain its tertiary structure independent of the rest of the protein. So as y'all see, when, when I'm in class, they, they, they like to go in and out, in and out, in and out. They expect you to truly understand a certain level of biochemistry before you even get in there, family. So I wanted everybody to begin to truly start understanding the in and out that that's happening as I'm teaching it, you know, where they're talking about a quaternary structure when they're talking about the protein, and then they're talking about the tertiary structure when they're talking about an isolated domain within a quaternary structure. All right. So think about this as a quaternary structure, and this is a tertiary structure within this domain that can operate on its own. And then this is another tertiary structure that hydrogen bonds together to create a quaternary structure. And these both function together to do different cellular functions within the body. All right. So proteins often have multiple domains, as I just explained, which may then interact with each other to form a functional unit, quaternary structures. All right, let's keep it moving. So in alcohol dehydrogenase, we can see how the domain we're examining now in yellow the domain, the tertiary structure of alcohol dehydrogenase. We can see how it interacts with a second domain, which features a Rossman fold, which is this right here. So we can understand this is a quaternary structure, and we can understand that this, what we see here in yellow, is a domain, a tertiary structure that can function on its own that has now hydrogen bonded to another tertiary structure that can operate on its own. And this creates what is known as the quaternary structure, a full protein. This is a full protein, alcohol dehydrogenase, all right? So the active sites of enzymes are often found in the loop regions. These loops, as we explained earlier, the active sites, all right? They're often found in the loop regions. And these loop regions can be shaped both chemically and structurally. So the loop regions can be formed chemically due to the chemical nature, as well as the structural nature of the loop. So however this protein needs to be formed, these loops can form to that structure due to its chemical nature, 
or due to its structural nature. So if we are trying to connect an alpha helix to a beta sheet that's over here, this loop will take information from the C terminus of the alpha helix, as well as take information from the C or N terminus of this beta sheet. And it will allow those chemicals or mineral structures or information within those mineral structures to bind and create these motifs, which are secondary structures. And then those go on to create, of course, the tertiary structures. All right, so I want everybody to truly begin to understand this family. We got to understand this, all right? So often active sites are in the crevices at the interface between two domains. These crevices are rich in loops. All right, so as y'all can see, this yellow tertiary structure connects to this other tertiary structure to create this quaternary structure. And in the middle here is normally where the active sites are. And these active sites are normally rich in loops. And as I explained, the active sites, like in hemoglobin, the main essential mineral with the active site within the hemoglobin is iron. Of course, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen as well. So I want us to begin to understand the importance of loops, how they are used to form motifs, and how these motifs, once they are built, how they are used to create the domains, and how these loops within the domain are used, again, to hydrogen bond to another tertiary structure to form a quaternary structure. All right, the active sites or the crevices are going to be rich in loops. So these loops are basically what hold together the active sites within a protein. All right, so loops are very important. We know alpha helices is very important. Beta sheets are very important as well. So I just wanted you to understand the importance of the loops. All right, so often the active sites are in the crevices, as I just explained, at the surface between two domains. So we see this is the surface between the two domains. And as y'all can see, Loops are very much so in abundance in these active sites, all right? So in alcohol dehydrogenase, the active sites, in the active sites lies these, these substrates, NADP and ethanol, all right, within the alcohol dehydrogenase. And these loops is basically what holds this information, holds these active sites together within the protein, all right? So I wanted everybody to understand this, family. I want everybody to understand this. And these active sites is normally what separates the two tertiary domains within the quaternary structure, all right? The active site, all right? So we understand this. We understand this now. So let's just keep it moving, family. We understand active sites. We understand that the loops contain a lot of this information that help hold the active sites within uh, quaternary structures, all right? So active alcohol dehydrogenase contains actually two identical protein molecules, as you can see now here. And this is what we've just, we've been explaining for the past few minutes here. Its quaternary structure is therefore a homodimer of two subunits, two tertiary structures, as I've been explaining. With each tertiary structures containing one active site at the surface of their two domains, all right? One active site at the surface of their two domains. All right, so as you can see, this parallel loop right here, that's connected, it has its helices right here once it starts, has its helices right here once it starts. And also we can see the parallel structure within the loop, I mean the, the beta sheets as well. So the active sites are normally gonna be within this area right here, family. All right, so I want y'all to understand what's being said here. All right, so note how part of the dimer interface is formed by two interfacing antiparallel beta strands, as I just explained here, antiparallel beta strands. Boom, all right, to generate one large beta sheet. So when these beta strands connect, this connects an entire beta sheet. This hydrogen bonding that takes place within beta sheets now takes place on both sides of the quaternary structure of the homodimer subunits of this quaternary structure. All right. All right. <laughs> we got that. We got that family. All right. Let's keep it moving. We're almost finished here, family. We almost finished. I just want to come bring this valuable information about proteins, about 
our building blocks of our bodies so we can truly understand it, all right? And the true deeper understanding of what Sebi was talking about. He knew what he was talking about. He was a biochemist. So let's keep this moving, all right? If you enjoyed this video, it's a probable guarantee that you're gonna like this one as well. So go ahead and give it a gander and remember to keep it cosmic.